and seeing videos, I saw actual videos and it's just a lot. <laughs> um, but of course let me know what you thought about this video in the comments and I hope you find it educational yet relaxing. So I am going to be talking today about the case of Diane Downs. Now like always, I always give a background, kind of the early life of the person that I'm covering. So. she was shot in her left 
So here is her story told by Detective Doug Welsh, and this was Detective Doug Welsh's first homicide investigation ever in his career, so he got an interesting one. So this is the story that Diane told him. She told him that that evening she had taken the children to a friend's house, and as it grew dark, she realized, okay, time to go home. On her way home, she decided to take a detour and take the children sightseeing. So she took an abandoned, deserted country road with the three kids in the back seat, and they were kind of just dozing in and out. It was late. It was dark outside. Diane claims that while they were on this road, a big, shaggy-haired man flagged her down to pull over. Now, this is red flag number one for me, because fast forward into the future, me driving down a road with my three kids in the back seat, if um, if anyone really, but especially a, a big man that I don't know is trying to flag me down on the side of the road, I would not stop. Maybe different times, whatever, I would not stop. I feel like most people wouldn't. But this, again, this is her story. This is what she said. So she pulled over, and when she did, this man demanded that she give him her car. And she claimed that when she denied it his request, he shot her children and then shot her. Um, so at first she didn't explain how, but she said as soon as she got away, she sped to the hospital as fast as she could. That was her story. Now, right away, very soon into her being in the hospital, both investigators and hospital employees alike realized that there was something very off about this woman. They realized that a lot of things she was saying either didn't make sense or didn't add up. She did not show any emotion. She never cried over her daughter who passed away. She never seemed too worried about her children who were clinging on to their lives by a string. So here are a couple of things that and were red flags to the people who saw her that night. Number one, who goes sightseeing at night with three sleeping children? Especially in the area that you live around. Like, who goes sightseeing at night? Two, again, like I said, she was way too calm for a mother who had gone through a traumatic event like that with her children. And I, I listened to part of an interview with her, and I pulled out a quote, and she said, direct quote, I just kept saying, God, do what's best. If they gotta die, let them die, but don't let them suffer. Shortly after that, when the surgeon went to go look at her arm and take care of her, she started complaining to him about how the blood ruined her new car, the inside of her car. That's what she was worried about. Now, investigators also started thinking, and they were thinking if this man wanted her car, and he felt threatened to the point where he had to shoot because he wanted the car that bad. He would not have fatally shot the children. He would have fatally shot Diane. Because what, what are the kids going to do? They can't drive away from him. Diane is the threatening one. Then there was no blood splatter on the driver's side of the car, nor was there gunpowder residue on the driver's door or the interior door panel. If her story was 100% accurate, there would have been all of those things, and there was nothing. Additionally, Christy, the daughter who had had the stroke, the oldest child, as she began to kind of regain her strength as time went on and was able to speak a little more, she was able to mumble, and investigators would ask her what she remembered from that night. Now again, she couldn't talk very well, and it was hard for them to understand her. But from what they did gather from what she was saying, there was no memory of a man of any kind at all in her story. So investigators and detectives, they started to scratch their heads a little bit because things were not making sense. Then Diane began to give interviews to the media. She began talking to all of these media outlets and um, the, the detective, Doug, he was saying how oh, she just kept talking. It was like she just, she would just talk and say anything. And he said it was almost like she was her worst enemy. Like she would just say things and you could listen to the things that she was saying and you could look at the face of the reporter and they're listening to her and they're kind of like, 
our neighbors um, and other people who saw her car, they reported seeing the car driving in the direction of the hospital, but the car was driving ridiculously slow, like I'm talking a high speed of 5 to 7 miles per hour. That's how slow she was driving to the hospital. She was trying to give her children time to bleed out so they would be dead by the time they got to the hospital. Come on. So, I remember she claimed that she sped as fast as she could to the hospital. So, based on all this evidence, Diane was arrested on February 28th, 1984, nine months after the shooting. She was charged with one account of murder and two counts each of attempted murder and criminal assault. And, of course, the children needed to be placed somewhere, so they were placed in protective custody for the time being. Our two surviving children. So now, things keep getting better. While she was on trial, Diane was actually pregnant. And we'll get into how in a second, but when basically asked she wanted to get pregnant. She said, I got pregnant because I miss Christy and I miss Danny and I miss Cheryl so much. I'm never going to see Cheryl on earth again. And I just, you can't replace children, but you can replace the effect they give you. And they give me love. They give me satisfaction. They give me stability. They give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy. And that's gone. They took it from me. But children are so easy to conceive. So what she had done is on her mail route while she was working, she had tricked and seduced a man into sleeping with her and got pregnant. And a journalist slash reporter by the nan by the name of Anne Jager, she said, I pulled a quote from her, and she said she calculated that this would win her sympathy in the trial. I mean, obviously, if she's pregnant, she loves children, right? And another journalist was saying, you know, who on the jury is going to want to send a pregnant mother to jail for life? This was her, this was her strategy. So, the trial, be the trial began. And things started moving. After months of physical and mental therapy, uh, Christy Downs, the oldest child who had had the stroke, she was nine years old as the trial was going on. She was healthy enough to take the stand and answer questions. District Attorney Fred Hughey, he asked her, do you remember who shot you? And she point blank said, my mom. And um, neighbors had also claimed, I remember reading that she had voiced to a few people that she was fearful of her mother. Um, so because of that, Diane was found guilty in June and she faced life in prison plus 50 years. The court, of course, was recessed for a brief minute between the verdict and the sentencing, sentencing so that she could give birth. Um, and this baby, she was a little girl, and she was adopted and named Becky Bobcock. And Becky has been very open and verbal about her relationship with her biological mother. She was on 2020. She was on all these other shows um, with people that interviewed her. She said that in the beginning, she tried to have a relationship with her biological mom. She wrote her letters, and at first, Diane's letters were, she answered immediately, and they were nice letters, and she would say, you know, uh, you look just like me, um, you're pretty. She would say, oh, we have the same chin, don't you hate it? Stuff like that. And then as the letters went on, Diane just started to get, like, more and more insane she would say things like she started blaming Becky for basically everything for how her life turned out when Becky literally had nothing to do with it. Um, so, yeah, so she completely cut off talking to her biological mom and then she began to tell her story and voice to all these different uh, media outlets um, about how it felt to know that her mom was a killer. She actually got a lot of coverage from it. So yeah, so that's pretty sad, but um, at least she was adopted and, you know, has a different life, so um, she's much older now. She has, like, a 17-year-old son, or, 
skinned by this woman and like of course of course she's gonna figure out how to escape prison so she managed to escape prison and fled to um one of her inmates husband's house that was a few blocks away from the prison she was found there two weeks later um she was then transferred to a more secure facility and she actually had to be transferred to four different jails um because she just kept trying to escape now she remains in a prison in California. She was denied parole in 2008 and she'll have to wait to apply for parole until 2020 when she'll be 65 years old, which is a year from now. So I mean, it's, she's 64 right now and I saw pictures of the way she looks now. She has gray hair, she looks older, but in my opinion, the same like cold, demonic face. Um, she, I read that she was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorders and another disorder that I don't remember what it was called and I don't want to guess and be wrong, but she's, she's got some stuff going up, going on up there, obviously. Um, but on the bright side, her two surviving children went to live with the lead prosecutor, Fred Yugi, who we mentioned before, and he and his wife, Joanne, actually adopted them in 1986 and created a better life for them. So not only did he help send their mother to prison where she belongs, but he gave them a better life, so I like Fred. <laughs> um, and this, uh, this story, this case, has actually been made into a movie and a book. It's called Small Sacrifices, and I'm actually very interested in watching the movie um, and seeing how they, they portrayed it. I saw a few clips, and it pretty much matches everything that I just read to you, so... I'm very interested. It's, a, it's an old movie. Um, not anything recent, but I'm still interested to watch it, so. Um, anyway, that is all I have for you on uh, Diane Downs. Very creepy case. Very... I feel like I say the same thing at the end of every Juke kind of video, but there's a lot of messed up people in the world, and it makes me very sad. But, anyway. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any requests for any other that you want me to cover that haven't been covered by any other ASMR artists.